All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go ahead and call our October 11th meeting to order. Uh, I'd like to ask Chief Wilkerson to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. Got Director Spragans back with us this month. He's uh he's here, so I'm gonna ask him if he could lead us in a prayer this morning. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first and foremost, let's uh, talk about our people, our friends in Florida, and we know that what they're going through over there now. We, we've all been there. Most of us have been there. We've seen it. We understand what's happening. Uh, keep them in your prayers. If there's things that we can do for them to help them, we need to be looking at that. We need to be looking at ways to help them to be able to uh, recover from this uh, horrible disaster. And um, uh, we all know it takes 10 years to get your feet back on the ground. And that's just to get your feet back on the ground. So uh, it's gonna be a while for them. And we got Louisiana and Texas over the last few years prior to that. We've been lucky. Let's just pray to the Lord that uh, we stay lucky. And uh, with that, if I could, let's go to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve. We ask that you just take this commission and this agency, and let us run it as the way that you would have it done. And Lord, we ask that we use it under your guidance and not ours. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Joe. All right, approval of minutes. Last month, we had to table the August minutes uh, because they were not completed. Uh, so we'll look from, are we, is that, okay. Yeah, that's not clickable. We're still not ready for that. Oh, I've got it. Okay. So the, the August minutes aren't ready yet. We'll take that up next month. Okay. All right. So do, do we need to make a motion to table that again or? No, we don't. We haven't. Okay. Presented we're good. Answer. All right. So motion to approve September 20th minutes. I'll make a motion. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, approval of the agenda. Can we get a motion to approve today's agenda? I'll second that. All in favor? All right, Mr. Joe, it's all yours. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, let's see, we're looking at the uh, very first thing we don't want to talk about is our employment contracts. And if we could bring them up. I know I got them here somewhere. So I can look at them. All right, we got uh, Brianna Andrews, uh, who is an environmental natural resources specialist, too, with the Grand Bay Near. Uh, and we got uh, Jacob Nick, Nick Nicholson, and uh, he is environmental uh, natural resources science specialist, too, with marine fisheries at Lyman Hatchery. And we got uh, Eric uh, is it Giggly. Giggly, I'll get it right one time. I mean, he's been with us a while, but he's been promoted as a specialist team lead. Any questions on them? All right. As far as contracts, I don't think we have any right now. And let's see. As far as procurement and contracts, I think we're good on that. We we have them. Don't don't think we're not doing procurement and contracts. But there's only we only the ones that bring that we have, meet a certain level that we bring to y'all. We don't have any that doing it at that time. Okay. Is that right, Leslie? Am I still correct? Okay. All right. Uh, if you have public comment. Uh, please uh, let uh, either Crystal or TJ or someone know, and uh, we have a form for you to be able to get that to us and let us know. Uh, motion to modify the agenda to add. Is there something there, Crystal, that I didn't know about? Oh, I was to say, what is that? Okay. All right. So we got, to, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. They did the update. All right, uh, one thing we are going to look at before we get out of here today is maybe making a motion to change the December meeting because that's Christmas week. And we might want to change that, but we can do that toward the end if, and make it there. So we'll try to keep up with that. Give you a little bit of idea of what's going on. The derelict vessels, you know, we, we got the legislation passed last year to be able to do derelict vessels. And since then, we've had uh, a total of 63 derelict vessel cases have been reported. And we've started tracking. 36 of those have already been removed. All right. 
27 are pending removal, and eight we have received court orders to remove. So uh, we, the uh, the team uh, is doing a heck of a job on that, and uh, they're they're moving it forward, and uh, we're getting this done. And Sandy and her group is helping us fantastically to be able to get these court orders and get them done. And uh, to just thinking that we got 36 of the 63 already removed. And it's amazing how many people just jumped out there and moved them once we told them it, we were serious about it. So uh, we're doing good. We're doing very good. And we just applied for a grant with GOMA, and uh, and the grant is a federal grant to be able to do this in, for the future. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some money there. And that's not just der derelict vessels, but it's to remove anything, like, you know, after a storm especially, it's all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but uh, there's a lot of things that we can remove out of the water. All right, another thing is October 16th, uh, we have the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, the 73rd Annual Meeting in San Antonio, and Rick and I will be there till the uh, 19th. He'll be there the 20th. Then on the 20th, uh, I'll be in Gulf of Mexico Alliance in uh, Gulf Shores. And the 24th, we start the Gulf Council uh, meeting here in Biloxi at the Boy Vodge, and they'll be here all week. Uh, and then on October the 31st, I'll leave and go to San Diego for the National States Directors for the uh, for NOAA. So uh, we're finally getting to have one of those. It's been three years we've been trying to plan this thing. And so finally we're getting to do it. Uh, other than that, let's see, we got our processor update. It's Tracy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Director Spragans, and Ms. Chestnut. Um, we are in final legal reviews uh, and finances, going over the paperwork, getting signatures, and um, we're almost there. So, thank you. Yeah, and uh, we should have that. Uh, we're to the point of about to go to finance for the for the payment, right? Yes, they're with finance now, and they're working through the process. But everyone and uh, and we can you kind of just give a little overview of how the process was so everybody understands. Sure. So applications were open from July first through uh, August sixteenth. Um, we reviewed all the paperwork, made sure it was legit and would meet the grant requirements. Um, we finalized the process of um, we used a formula that that gave everybody the same percent of their loss um, until they until the funds were used. Um, so it was split equally that way. Um, and then we we have that uh, in the paperwork that, e that each recipient will receive. And um, we've turned all that information over to the finance and legal offices for the recipients to review they can sign the paperwork as they agree with it, and then they will be paid. Right. About 1.6 million, just shy of that, is what, yes, sir. what we're distributing, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Any questions with her on that? All right, Rick, you got anything on the Bonnie Carey? Uh, unfortunately, there is no updates on the Bonnie Carey. That's the, the usual monthly update. But I will feed off what Director Sprague said about the Gulf Council meeting. It's been 2020 or 2019 since we've had it here in Mississippi. Um, but on Wednesday, there is uh, the public Wednesday afternoon public comment period. And so anybody that wants to provide public comment on what's currently on the agenda or anything that you think the council needs to hear about, uh, Wednesday afternoon, you can call in, but because it here, it's 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 here in person. That would be a good opportunity to get those comments in. Okay, questions on that. Sandy, we actions update. Yes, last month uh, we had two state saltwater youth finfish records for roadie arms, conventional tackle red fin needlefish, and fly fishing records hardhead catfish. The commission recommended approval, and the director approved those. And the pending item we have going forward is the approval of the August 18th meeting minutes. And that's okay. it. So we're going to continue with that. It has not been uh, completed yet. All right, sir. Anything else? That if not, that's my report. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Either one of y'all got anything to report on today? All right. Nothing on the commissioner's report. So, chief.
Good morning. Hope everybody's well. Our report actually is pretty short and sweet. Nothing just jumps out at me. I do, I do, I do always like reading how many stops are we make during the month. Uh, we're over twenty two hundred stops for the month of September. Also, looking at the citations, uh, fifty three citations were written during that month. But looking at it, uh, commissioners and everything looks pretty straightforward. Nothing just jumps out at me. If you have anything that uh, you may want to talk about, I may not know the answers at the time, but I can get them. So anything, go right ahead, sir. I got anything? It seems like each month I get to commend y'all on a, on a successful stop that they made on me. We had another one this month. They do a great job every time, too. Sure. Well, we, we we talked about that in text. I understand, and uh, they they're, they they like uh, they like doing the job, and they they like what they do. So. Yeah, no. So yeah, my clients actually commended on how professional and courteous they were whenever whenever everything was over. One of them was drinking a beer. He said, "Am I gonna get in trouble for this?" <laughs> I said, "No, you're okay. <laughs> I just can't have it." <laughs> well, well, thank you. That that goes a long way. Yeah, thank good you. job out there. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right. Nothing, nothing. We're going to move on to Office Finance Administration, Ms. Leslie Brewer. Good morning, everyone. I'm Leslie Brewer, CFO. I'll be presenting the financials for the month and then September 30th, 2022. Um, at the end of uh, September, our state revenue was 3.4 million. Our agency revenue was 4.2 million. Our state net income was 2 million. And our agency net income was a negative 382,000. And as soon as we get our Tidelands check, that will flip into the black. Um, after three months, we have 96.9% .9 of the budget remaining for the operating budget and then 94.1% for Tidelands. Does anyone have any questions? ma'am looks like we're good thank you okay, thank you <clears throat> miss charmaine good morning commissioners director spragans miss chestnut the mississippi department of marine resources had no media mention since the september macmr meeting Marine Patrol participated in National Night Out at St. Clair Church on October 1st, as well as Paddle Paradise in Diamond Head on September 24th, which the Mississippi Gulf Coast National Heritage Area also provided a booth. Shrimp and Crab Bureau Director Jason Soche took part in Career Day at Paso Road Elementary School yesterday, and today Director Spragans and Trevor Moncrief will pre be presenting at the Biloxi Rotary Club meeting to update about our agency and in inshore fishing. All right, thank you. <clears throat> we got a few people waiting on this one so next up will be jason Ryder with our oyster reef assessment oh <laughs> sorry yeah good morning i am not jason Ryder. my name is ellen coffin and i am the shellfish biological coordinator or the specialist team lead and today we are going to oops uh, talk about our 2022 oyster reef assessment. Uh, so here is a graph that we've all seen many times. Uh, this shows kind of where we were at in the, uh, in the 90s, early 2000s, and where we're at now. Uh, as you can see, it's important to note that the last uh, recent years from 19 to 20 were um, 100% off-bottom oyster aquaculture harvests. So all of those numbers were converted to SAC numbers. So to get into our reef assessment of the reefs, we performed 71 minute dredge tows and 198 dive, square meter sample sites, which equates to 396 dive samples. So we're gonna go through and that was across the Mississippi Sound, but we're going to go through the public harvestable historic reefs only and not the ancillary ones. So all of the reefs are going or all of the slides are going to look very similar. You're going to have the notes in the top left. I guess I could use this. 
um, the map in the top right, and that's pretty much the natural reef footprint and the culture plants. The red dots are indicating either there's no material or there's just only dead oysters. This year it was mostly no, ma no material. The green dots are indications of live oysters. If there's a green halo, which I guess is kind of hard to see on this, uh, that indicates proportionally that there's more oysters in that location or on, th on that dive site. The bottom left is going to show you the size distribution. So it goes from spat size all the way up to market size. And then the bottom right is going to show you the best year in the past 10 years, which is major majorly uh, 2014, and compared to this year. So that kind of shows you where we would like to be. So we'll start off, we'll go worst to best, and we will start off with Henderson Point. So Henderson Point is approximately 1,300 acres. We found a lot of hook mussels on the material that we pulled up. Uh, limited suitable material for reef expansion and the majority of the areas sampled were soft moderate mud or material was buried. So the potential action would be to monitor in long term recovery mode. A lot of um, the reef bottoms that we sampled were soft mud so it seems like the bottom is changing in that location. St. Joe. St. Joe is almost 500 acres. The predators were low. The majority of oysters found within the cult plants only, and salinity seems to be a major factor in oyster growth and spawning. So our potential action is just to monitor, monitor mortality and the seed sizes as they grow. As you can see, we've got a lot of seed sizes, but not a lot of market size oysters. Past Christian Tonging. It's almost 900 acres. We had moderate uh, predators. Reef material was deteriorating due to low recruitment, and the majority of the oysters were found within that single cult plant right there. Uh, surrounding cult plants are almost entirely sand or shell hash. So we saw that essentially, since there wasn't a lot of recruitment, a lot of the material that we have put down is starting to deteriorate. So our potential action is to additionally culch to expand the productive plant there. So as you can see, we're still on the low end for size class distribution. Uh, we are not seeing market size oysters there yet. Um, we're not where we were in 2014. Past Christian dredging is approximately 933 acres. We had low predators, uh, same thing as past Christian Tonging. We had limited suitable material for reef expansion. Reef material is deteriorating due to low recruitment, and a majority of the oysters were found within the two bottom cult plants. So our recommendations is an additional cult, additional cult to expand the productive cult plants that we found. Okay, Telegraph Reef is approximately 1,260 acres. Uh, we typically observe a yearly spat set, but experience mortality when they reach seed size. And that's a trend we've noticed over uh, multiple years. So our potential action is to monitor salinity levels and effects on size distribution and survival. So you can see the uh, graph on the bottom left is heavy on spat sizes more than anything else. Pass Marianne. Pass Marianne is uh, hopeful, uh, rocking and rolling. <laughs> uh, reef footprint is 2,300 acres. It's the most productive reef in the West. However, the majority of their oysters are found within those uh, top left cult plants. However, we are seeing uh, Size classes indicating an early spawn in June and July, which could indicate that the broodstock was spawning all spawning season. So that's a good thing. Um, potential action. So as you can see up here, um, the cult plants that we have are very productive. So we would like to fill the voids and uh, kind of connect them all. So we would like to connect past cult plants, 
mulch plants to increase productivity. So it's important to note that on the bottom left, you we see a great healthy uh, variation of size classes, as well as in the bottom right, you can kind of see a similar trend to where we were in 2014. Obviously, our numbers aren't where they should be, but we're getting back to that. Biloxi Bay, uh, the reef footprint is 227 acre acres. The population and size classes are increasing annually since 2019. Obviously, it's all that reef footprint is entirely culture plant. So there's a lot of material in Biloxi Bay. Recommendations is to continue remote setting in strategic locations to increase spat settlement and broodstock development, and to also cultivate and monitor reef development. So to elaborate on the map, so we have, uh, here we go. That's our 2021 remote set deployment areas and the one on the right, I'm trying not to shake. <laughs> the 2022 remote set deployments. So we separated the uh, size class graphs instead of showing the best year to show uh, the difference between with remote set and without. So you can see the size class variations that way. So in conclusion, here is our uh, Mississippi 2022 oyster stock assessment. So it's kind of a uh, table of all of the market size oysters that we have calculated based on our reef assessment. As you can see, we are moving in the right direction past Marianne, Biloxi Bay, past Tonging and Henderson are better than they were last year. It's important to remember that 2019 we had the Bonnie Carey, 2020 we had limited brood stock available because of the Bonnie Carey, so we weren't getting a lot of spat sets. 2021, there was a lot of rainfall in the beginning of the season, so that could have stunted spawning activities. And then this year, 2022, we had great water quality. We had limited rainfall, so that's why the oyster distribution is better this year. And with that being said, conditions are favorable going into next year. So our staff recommendation, the samples indicate positive growth in the resource, but confirm the lack of size class variation and a resource that is still recovering from limited recruitment. So we would like to re recommend continue culch plants and spat on shell deployments to increase diversity in size classes. And we also recommend the continuing harvest closure of the 22-23 season. That's it. Any questions? So, back whenever, whenever we were talking about Henderson Point, and you said the majority of the area was soft, moderate mud. The bottom's changing. Is is that silting over, or is the culch that we're dumping there is that sinking? What? So it's it's probably a combination of both. So the culch plant is, or the culch is sinking because of no recruitment. And it's the oyster shell that we put there is deteriorating also because of low recruitment. And I think a lot of the hydrodynamics of the area is dumping a lot of silt in that on those. So does weeks. the potential for recruitment play into deciding where we're going to dump this culch? Because it seems like we've dumped a lot of stuff over the past few years with not a whole lot of yes. So positive. Correct. So the, the oysters or the uh, culture material that we put down, we go use ArcGIS to use our reef assessment data to make those decisions on where to put culture plants down. We also do uh, polling and try to decide the best bottom. But unfortunately, you know, a lot things are changing. Uh, we've had poor recruitment, so we haven't had the best situation in terms of productivity and and rebounding our reefs so whenever you say to continue coaching like henderson point will we continue to coach there even though it seems like it's almost lost or uh in my opinion henderson point would probably not be an ideal place to culch plant because of the bottom type it's important for us to put down culch material on moderate mud sand or existing culch plants just like a sprinkle over to kind of keep it healthy okay. got it. Go 
quick. The uh, the time frame from 09, 010, and the, just such the drastic difference to 2010, 2011. <clears throat> what was the, uh, that was on the second slide. Oh, not not anywhere in particular, gross. just the. Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah. How did, what, what was the, uh, the, the range was so significant from one year to the next. I was. Um. Bonnie, we had the Bonnie like Carey opened in 2011. <laughs> Was it in 2010? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, yeah, there you go. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that was a major thing there. The Bonnie Carey opened. If you look back around 2005, 6 was Katrina, and then uh, then the yes. Bonnie Carey and the oil spill in yes. 2010. Yeah, to recover from. Yeah, we had both of them hit in 2010, 11. So that was something that kind of, you know, took a lot out of it there. And uh, so that's where we're at. One other thing, I, we are looking at some things too, and uh, Ellen and them are doing a fantastic job, and they're working hard trying to get things uh, to, uh, you know, as much money as we spend on oysters, we would hope that we'd have some, because we, you know, we keep trying. <laughs> Nature's fighting against us sometimes, and we have to work on that, and that's the way it is. Two or three things that we're looking at to try to help bring this to a different look is number one, you know, we've lost a lot of water. People don't realize but we need fresh water during this time of year other time you know spring, summertime especially we need the fresh water well in the past we used to years ago whenever you see all these big mounds of uh, oyster shells everywhere in the world back uh, 30 years ago and whatever but it's because the pearl river was flowing into the gulf and it was coming in around those wet, all those western reefs and everything it was keeping the drills down and the drills wasn't eating up the oysters as fast and it and, and it made a whole lot of difference of what was happening. And then we turned around and somehow or another in our infamous knowledge years ago made a diversion uh, up around uh, Monticello and diverted about, supposedly it was going to divert close to 50%. And then it failed a few years back. And, uh, and when it did now, about 70% of the water out of the Pearl is going to the west over into Lake Pontchartrain area. Well, we've lost that water and we need to get it back. One of the things we're looking at is doing a study and uh, we've done a lot of work on it in the past, and it was to, uh, and and Mr. Vic Marber, is, uh, well, God rest his soul, was one of the men that taught me a lot about what to do here. And uh, the idea is we got to divert it, all right? So what we're looking at is we're looking at a possible diversion to take the Western Pearl and divert some of it back into the Eastern Pearl, in the, somewhere in the Sound, all right? How do you do that? Well, we're going to have to find a spot, and right now, the, through the studies that we've done so far and looked at, somewhere just north of I-10, over in Hancock County, in the marsh area, to be able to divert that, and we got to look at it. We're going to have to do a study and decide what it would cost. we got to get the core involved in it and say that this would work, and, we, and I think that we have, Louisiana seems to be on board with us to say that it's, everything's fine. We'd love to see some of it diverted out of Lake Pontchartrain. That could be a tremendous help to us because right now, this time of the year, well, this time not so much, but uh, the June, July, and August, you know, if uh, if you go to uh, some of the reefs out there, the reason that they're not productive is because the drills are just killing us. And, uh, I mean, they are just absolutely killing us. And, uh, you know, at this time, and when you think about that, you sit back and you say, well, okay, well, what, where were they at in the past? Well, they would vote. They they keep coming every year as long as salinity stays where it's high enough. And uh, you know, we're looking at some other things, and that's to rebuild some islands, the Cat Island area, and to rebuild some other areas to be able to change the water coming from the south to be able to keep it keep the salinity down. The salinity of the water is tremendously what's causing a lot of the Western Sound issue. Now, in the springtime, salinity's nothing. That's our problem because we're getting all this rain last year record rainfall record <laughs> rainfall in the state of mississippi we didn't get the bunny carry open but we got record rainfall i mean come on it seems like every time we turn around there's some little something hitting us right square in the face right but we have to look and we have to say okay we got record rainfall now let's see what we can do we're looking at the oyster setting and and trying and ellen and then we're in a and now in the middle of uh doing a study to be able to decide what's the best way to do this. And I think that we will get something that comes out of that to where we will decide how we can put some oysters in the water and continue to rebuild this over the years and continue and continue to rebuild it. So um, 
it's not like you're sitting down there twiddling the thumbs. I'll tell you that. And uh, they're doing hard work every day. Uh, the off bottom is doing great, and hopefully we'll expand it more. We've met with people over the last few weeks that are looking at different type off bottom, and uh, they're looking at ways of doing it. And uh, and I think it's got a lot of people got a lot of great ideas. And some of them is how do you grow water in a uh, restricted air, grow water to restricted air and then depurate them, and how we can do it. I think there's a lot of great ideas there. We're looking at uh, at past Christian, I mean Pascagoula over there now, and you know we got a lot of oysters over there, and they're beautiful. But the problem is when you try to move them, you wind up killing about a third of them or whatever. So the idea is how could we possibly do something? Is there a chance that we can do something over this next year? Uh, to where we move some small portion of those and be and able to be able to not kill them all when we move them, and, that, and it, to have some form of a harvest, and that might be something that we can look at. But there's a lot of things that are going on that uh, we just gotta we just gotta give it time. And I know, and if everybody says, well, you know, gosh, it's been 2016 since we really had a harvest, right? And we didn't have much then. Well. Go to say, go over to uh, Florida and look at some of the biggest areas there. They've been shut down for five to seven years. There's a lot of places in the same boat that we're in, and there's a lot of them have had the same issues. And uh, and Florida's issues were the same problem: Georgia damming up the water and not letting it come down to them. So a lot of issues over there is the same issue that we have here. And so we just got to get better at what we're doing. As far as uh, we're getting smarter, I can tell you that. And uh, they're moving them, and uh, it just exactly I loved what loved their statement. I, as a scientist, she wouldn't recommend that. Okay, that's because she's done the study. That's because she's done the work. That's because she's looked at it and said, "I just don't think this is a smart thing to do." And it's also that she would tell you if it was my back pocket, I wouldn't spend it there, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, seriously. Yeah. If it's coming out of my back pocket, I wouldn't spend it there. I'd spend it somewhere else. Well, guess what? This money that we're spending. It's coming out of every back pocket in this room and across the state of Mississippi and everywhere else because every dime that we do somehow, some way comes out of a taxpayer somehow. And uh, so the, everything that we're spending on this comes from a taxpayer some way, somehow. And I love the attitude that they're doing it. And I love the attitude of what they're trying to make this work. And I just ask it everybody, if, we, if, it, if it comes that we have zero, zero in 2022, 23 season, please understand why. I just... One other point on that, you know, you brought up Florida and, and the other places, and I know that they've been dealing with stuff, but Joe, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot. I spent a lot of my days just a little bit south of there in the Biloxi Marsh. Um, and we're saying that drills are our biggest problems. Do they not deal with that there? Or how, how does... So, yes, so, uh, what Director Spragan said about the oyster drills needing that fresh water to kind of keep them at bay. It depends on salinity on, you know, times when we do our reef assessment. So, but we have not seen a lot of drills in Biloxi Bay. So. No, not Biloxi Bay, the Biloxi Marsh, right across the Louisiana line and the upper end of the Biloxi Marsh in Louisiana waters there. I mean, those reefs out there seem to be thriving. There Are, are they not dealing with the drills like we are here? Or? Well, you're talking private reefs. Which is a little different, okay? Because they can, what they will do, and um, if they own a private reef, they will go out there. If the drills are there, they'll move the root, they'll move the oysters. They'll just pack them up and move them, because they have that capability. And once again, it's coming out of their back pocket, and so they're they're trying to find a way to make them work. And they are having issues. I mean, don't get me wrong; everybody has the same issues. And uh, but uh, we're Telegraph Reef is not far from there, right? Uh, Rick, you doing from the Biloxi Marsh? That's probably the closest area to it. Oh, St. Joe. Joe. Yeah. St. Joe would be the closest one to it. So, you know, you can get an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of things about where they're at, too. They, they back up behind an island which makes it a little bit different on the uh, the salinity, the way the water goes. So there's a lot of other things that you're looking at. And and I know they, the one that you're talking about that does all the reefs over there, and, and I, I tell you, they're moving them around too. And um, that's the other thing. We're 
we want to look at how in the future that we can get more people and i'm talking uh private individuals doing their own reefs because we need that we need that in mississippi because guess what they're going to fight themselves to death to keep that thing alive and we want to try to wait to find a way to help them and that's the way we'd like to do i'd love to have a program put together and that's what they're working on right they have some other programs to where we could help subsidize someone to get in business and then we turn around and uh the secretary of state lease them or you know through us lease the bottoms to them at a, at a good rate and then be able to use those bottoms and fish them now don't get me wrong we're still going to have public reefs but we still need to have some others involved in it and uh, and i think that uh we have put a whole lot of effort in the oysters in the last few years i can tell you that and uh, i think jonathan had a question too oh i'm just curious Um, hmm, that's a good question. Let me help you out. <laughs> All right, the answer is we can, every oyster we can get, we can sell. All right, right now, everybody I've met with, everybody that I've talked to that are dealing with oysters, uh, uh, some gentlemen we met with yesterday, that, you know, that they could sell every oyster they can get their hands on. And the question is, can they get them? Jennifer Jenkins told me, she said, I'm not in, I don't need to go. I can't get enough oysters. I sell every one I have. Uh, the people are said, and I believe we could do that. Now, the problem that you're talking about is if it's a private, I mean, a public reef, are we going to have enough fishermen? Mm -hmm. All right. And that question may be that you're, we don't. We may not have enough fishermen right. to do it as far as public fishermen because the one thing that we have done, and it's killed us, 2011 to Bonnie Carey, 2016, we got the money. Come on, five years later. Here it is, 2019, we got the Bonnie Carey, had the Bonnie Carey issue. Here we are at 22 and still don't have the money. Fixed to be in 23, four years later. That's what's killing us because part of that money is supposed to go to help pay for those people to stay in business and be able to operate. We're losing them right and left. And I, it's the same thing in the shrimping industry, the same thing in, in everything that we're doing. We are not gaining fishermen. We're losing them every day. And if I'm wrong, Rick, tell me. But I, I think that's 100%. We're losing them in every aspect of the fishery, not just the oysters. And, um, and that's hard. That's tough. Anything else? Anything else, Kim? Right. Thank well, you. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Rudy Arms show. Yeah, it's, I'd, I'd say if we go one more month and it's just Rudy that has a saltwater record, let's just change it to the Rudy show. <laughs> just keep it that way. All right, so we've got um, one youth conventional tackle record for y'all today. It's a black tip shark, uh, Carcharinus lumbatus, 58 pounds, and the angler was Mr. Rudy Arms. There is a picture of the fish. There is a picture of Rudy with the fish. And so all we need is a motion to recommend adoption of the new state record. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? All right. Thank you, Trevor. All right. All right. Today we're getting an update from the Grand Bay Near. We've got Miss Aisha Gray. I, I, I'm getting them all wrong today. I'm sorry. Reading what's on your list. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm Marga Poston. I'm with the Grand Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. I'm the Coastal Training uh, Program Coordinator. And today I'm just going to provide you an update on some of the things that we've been doing out there since the beginning of our funding in July. Um, but first off, I, w I just want to mention Amber, uh, Amanda Free. She's uh, our new Davidson Fellow. Um, and we, her, she's with the Mississippi State University. Her advisor is, is Eric Sparks. Um, she's working with uh, MSU, of course, and uh, DMR Fisheries um, to do some tracking, uh, some bacterial source tracking over in uh, Grand Bay waters. So currently our waters are closed to shellfish uh, fishing um, because of the high Eli, Eli, 
E. coli uh, numbers. Um, and she's doing tracking source just to find out uh, what kind of uh, E. coli that is, if it's a natural occurring coli from the animals that are out there, or if it's actually related to human. Um, so right now we don't know. We do know that it's out there. Um, so she's using DNA to try to determine uh, what type of E. coli that is. And if it is indeed um, from septic systems, then we'll follow that up and see where that might be coming from. Um, but she's currently uh, working on this. She's collecting and processing. She's doing some of her processing over at the EPA lab, I think, in Gulfport. Um, so she's also working with them, too. And this, this was uh, um, in coordination with, again, MSU and then the DMR uh, uh, fisheries. And I think it's a two-year project. Um, but we're happy to have her out there. Um, and then, um, so just an update on our NERDA project. So we've been doing this for a few years now. Uh, recently, we had the Seven Brothers unit uh, mulched. Uh, we hired contractors, the Eco Restore, um, that do the mulching. Um, it's a big piece of equipment that comes in and just kind of chews up everything in its path. Uh, um, so they've worked, done work with us before, um, but this tract was about 110 acres that they did. Uh, we did have, uh, so they're mulching up uh, invasive species for the most part. Um, so uh, we had an opportunity to have uh, DMR's IT come out and they flew some dr some drones, and so we were able to um, kind of look at the areas that we knew where invasive species were. Um, they uh, flew the drones. We were able to put these uh, polygons and other shapes on the areas um, just to verify that they were actually um, getting the areas that we needed um, mulched um, in order to kind of eradicate some of those invasive species. And so um, they did a good job, um, and uh, we appreciate the, the help from uh, IT. Um, so this is another project. So Evo or Evo Gross, he's a graduate student with Auburn. He's looking at the genetic diversity between uh, uh, ornate uh, diamondbacks, uh, terrapins, a, a population that's in Mississippi as well as population in Alabama. Um, he's looking at to see if they're uh, different populations or if there's if they're distinct populations uh, between the two states. Uh, so stewardship, uh, they help him go out and uh, he collect he collects. Uh, uh, terrapin eggs. So this, they go, it's a uh, nest out on Point Oshins. So he took a, he came out, we collected eggs. Uh, he took them back to Auburn. They hatched out. Uh, once they hatched out, he takes this genetic sampling um, and then he puts them back where the same place where they uh, were found. Uh, so the, uh, our stewardship group, they uh, ended up releasing 102 hatchlings um, from 13 different clutches. Uh, we're kind of actually happy about this because there's a very high uh, uh, predation on the hatchlings in the nests that are on Point Oceans. Actually, all of our uh, terrapin uh, sites are heavily predated upon. So we know that there's 102 of them that are gonna be out there. Now, whether they'll all survive for seven, eight years before they come back and and uh, uh, lay their own, own uh, nest uh, eggs, uh, we don't know because few survive, but at least these little guys are gonna get a good start. And um, these are just some uh, pictures uh, that Sandra uh, Bilbo took uh, while she was out there, while they were releasing them. Um, they're pretty cute. And hopefully at least, you know, one will come back um, to reproduce. So um, this is the training, uh, coastal training. This is my section. Uh, we've been pretty busy uh, since the beginning of July. Then we've uh, held two uh, wilderness first aid uh, courses. Uh, wilderness first aid, we partner with a group out of Utah. Uh, Longleaf Medicine. There's not very many of these type of uh, groups around the United States, but they come in. Um, they teach us uh, how to improvise when you're out in the field far away from any kind of emergency responder. Uh, so if there is an incident that, that uh, you look around, you improvise with what you do have um, to try to stabilize that person until you can get them either all the way back or until uh, emergency personnel can reach them as far as taking care of any kind of uh, first aid or uh, emergency issue that needs to be done. So as I said, we held two of these. Um, one was for the general public because, uh, you know, local resource management, they're oftentimes out in uh, far away from any kind of medical response as well. Consultants, Boy Scout leaders, um, they go on trips and so out in the woods and so they, they want to have that training. Um, uh, and then there's just uh, a few people that were there just because they like to hike out in the wilderness and so they have that training as well. Uh, the other training was for staff, specifically staff. Um, we were, actually had two uh, personnel from DMR that actually came over too um, to, uh, have, to um, participate in those trainings. Um, in October 18th, we have a, a wetlands uh, delineation plan ID course coming up. We had one in April. 
Um, it was over. It was f filled. We had a, a, a waiting list, and from that waiting list, we decided to fill this course. We have a waiting list for this course. I think after COVID, I think that there a lot of people weren't able to do a lot of trainings, and so we've had a overwhelming uh, response for this course. So, if we um, get a big enough list wait list on this course, then we'll plan on having another one in uh, April. Um, so that's that's. Uh, yeah, that's so we'll we'll see at the end of this one. Um, we were awarded an EPA grant in um, for stormwater uh, for some stormwater work that we're trying to do over in Moss Point. That was awarded to us in February, but we had our first community meeting in September. Um, we had about 40 people that showed up, um, which I was very happy to get that big of a response. Uh, they uh, we talked to them about current issues with their flooding in their neighborhoods, and also tried to uh, we collected their input and then also. Uh, try to get recruitment for helping us to monitor floodwaters and then also help with the, some of the green infrastructure installation and maintenance. So I'm um, very happy that, that we had that kind of response and looking forward to continuing with the work for the EPA award. Um, other awards that we've tried to do or, or we have received, uh, we have a new education grant that we did receive. Brianna Andrews, uh, 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 Mr. Spragans had uh, mentioned her earlier. She's a new hire on this project. It's uh, the bio Biodiversity Relationship and Aquatic Chemistry Knowledge in Saline Habitats, or bra Brackish. Um, they'll be working with uh, eighth grade high school, high, uh, eighth grade uh, students, um, and they'll actually go out into the into the uh, estuary. They'll get samples, fish samples, uh, water samples, and have a better understanding of uh, of uh, the estuary and the uh, marine habitats. Um, so that we were awarded that one. Uh, we're also working with the University of Southern Mississippi on a, uh, another uh, uh, Academy of Science uh, grant that we're working with them. It's a six month grant. It should have started uh, 1st of October, which we're gearing up to get started on that. Um, the other two, uh, the Digital Coast we've submitted, um, that's basically to do some rain garden demonst demonstrations on rain gardens as an education piece. Uh, we've submitted that one. Um, and the next one with NOAA, we're still working on that. They extended that, uh, they extended that deadline until the end of October. Um, but again, that's relating to uh, stormwater management over in, Mo in Moss Point. And then uh, the next one, uh, the NIFWIF, that was actually with the Mississippi State, not the University of Southern Mississippi. That's actually uh, Mississippi State. But the next one, uh, the NOAA, that's uh, uh, another one that we submitted. Um, that's also with uh, Mississippi State and uh, University of Southern Miss. Uh, but all of these are related to, uh, to uh, stormwater uh, management over in Moss Point since they have such a, a huge uh, flooding issue. Um, this is our education uh, section. You can see that they've been quite busy since August. Um, we, we've done several, uh, we've done a Raptor Road Show, we've done several homeschool, uh, uh, fly tie class. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, kids come out, elementary kids come out for kayaking um, and just seeing uh, the habitat that's out there. Uh, they did do a teacher open house over at the Infinity Center. Um, which they had teachers come in and, and talk to them about some of the ish, some of the uh, topics out in the marsh. Um, we had our National Estuaries Day on September 24th. I think we had something like 90 people that were on boats that we got out into the estuary to teach them about uh, what they have here in their backyard. Um, then a new program that we started, which is kind of exciting, uh, it was it's with the uh, veterans uh, group over in Biloxi. Uh, that's for the hearing impaired. Uh, you probably know that frogs have their own calls uh, similar to birds. So they were able to get uh, the visually impaired folks out into the out into the habitat so they could listen to those frogs and they could help or they could un they could hear them and then identify the type of frogs that they are listening to. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and I think that's it. This is just uh, more pictures from our outreach. So that's all the updates I have. I'm taking any questions that you might have? I will. I will say with the NERDA project, um, that piece was 110 acres so far. They've masticated uh, 210 acres. They've got 500 acres that they're looking at that they will be going in um, for for thinning, uh, which they're cutting uh, all the slash pine, pine uh, six inches and up. But a total of 800 acres have been cleared either through mastication or thinning. So, any questions? Thank you, Margo. Hey, and uh, Jared, we have we're working on some other one. I think too with uh, to buy some more land over in that area. Is that right? 
Yes. Margo, uh, you know about that land too? I don't have all the updates on that, but I do know that we're getting some surveys uh, done. Yeah, I'm talking about working with uh, uh, Chris Wells and then with DEQ about doing a uh, purchase on some land over there that uh, so much wetland, so much upland. I don't know the exact details. I know they're looking at it. Uh, Jennifer sits on those calls with the with the land acquisition, but they are actively looking at parcels coastwide to purchase, and there are some over there. And I want to say there's like three or four hundred acres at uh, Upland, and then the rest of it's. Uh... I was in New Hampshire last week, but I know they went on some site visits, so maybe they went. Um, and I actually haven't seen it. We haven't crossed paths. She's been out, and she's at DEQ today, so maybe they're looking into that some more. Okay. Mr. Dean, right. that's a good update. If you hadn't, if you hadn't been to the near, you need to go out there, and um, you'd be a little bit uh, impressed on what's going on with them. It's one of the coast best kept secrets, I guess. That people really should go visit there. They came out and helped out with our kids' event at the boat show last year, and they were a big hit with the stuff that they they taught the kids. So, they're doing good things over there. All right, have we got any public comments? No public comments, but I do have a couple of things on other business. All right, well, that was what I was headed into. All right, Rick, could y'all give us an update on the um, snapper season? Yes, uh, so right now, as of last weekend, we've called an estimated 112,781 pounds, which is roughly 74.4% of our ACL, which as we've talked about is 151,550 pounds. Um, had a good weekend last weekend. The weather's starting to cool down. The water's cooling down, and the CPUE is going up. The average weight's going up. So, um, we I don't know if this trend is going to continue, but they, they they have started to catch a few more fish. And um, we're meeting uh, obviously with NOAA. Uh, I mean, with the uh, Gulf Council and all, we'll be meeting at the end of this month. But uh, I can tell you the the situation that's going on with our snapper. They're not backing off trying to cut our allocation. They're still trying to do it. And uh, Trevor is fighting hard for us in the SSC. And uh, Trevor's fighting to get, keep us to where we're at. We've got several scenarios that we're looking at. But uh, I don't see that we get out of here with 150,000 pounds after the, in 2023. And Trevor, Rick, y'all want anything you want to bring up on that? So... We have, I mean, we've looked through the wave specific estimates. We've looked through the data. We've had our arguments. We made our presentations to the transition group. We've, um, we've really laid everything out there and we've laid it out there multiple times. Um, what that has culminated to is, um, a difference in understanding, um, that has to be resolved so we can move forward with management. So essentially what we are um proposing in our scenario is a way to calibrate our landings while also taking into account the um effects that seem to hit our state much harder than any other state so what we're proposing is to eliminate wave five from the conversation and only use high use waves waves three and four um knowing that there are still some issues with wave three and four that we see but um, it's a better argument for us and constrain the years to 2018 to 2020, um, essentially to make up for those large scale issues that we're seeing. Um, and what that would do, the proposal gives us approximately 109,000 pounds, um, which is right around as you see what we've harvested in this season to date. Um, and it seems like to us um, about the best compromise for the situation and allows us to understand, or allows us uh, essentially what we're saying is that we know there are fundamental differences between our program and the Emirate program, but we should not be fully penalized because of those differences. We should be able to, um, you know, find a balance between the biases that affect our state and our program and, and figure out a number that works for both sides. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And just to give you an idea, if you think about it, you know, we've been open how many days now, Trevor, you had any idea? Um, over a hundred, didn't it? Yeah, it's over a hundred. 
Yeah, and, uh, uh, you know, normally that's not the type season. What I'd like to see, and this is what that uh, Trevor and Rick and uh, and Matt and them are working on, and Tracy, what I'd like to see is a set deal to where we, we get a number and say it is 109,000, okay? That's our number. That's what we get. They say that's where the number's at. That we set a season and we open and close and we give people a year ahead of time or as much as possible to say this is what we're going to do. In other words, we have to give them time to regenerate and uh, rebuild uh, with the pressure on the reefs and all. But if I if I went in and said, okay, we're going to open up uh, the, the last weekend in April and then we're going to open up uh, the whole month of May and, and June or whatever, and then we're going to close down. I'm, I'm just throwing numbers. I mean, don't get me wrong. None of these are out there yet. But something that we could lay out to like the charter boats and take and turn around and say, okay, I know when I'm chartered. I, the fishermen that are coming down, not just the ones that live here in South Mississippi, but the ones that are coming down can set their time frame to say, I want to come to South Mississippi this time because that's when the season's going to be up and I can fish. Kind of like we do in hunting and everything else. You know, just put something out there that would be structured. And then we could still probably use somewhere between 55 and 80 days, 70 days. We could still do that. And then, and uh, But we could structure it. In the summertime, when you figure like uh, for, from the middle of July to the to the middle of August, especially, is a breeding time, right? Mm -hmm. Is a huge breeding time for snapper. Why don't we give them a break during that time? Why don't we back off and look at them during that time and say, hey, this is this helps us out more than one way because the snapper can you know have pressure off of them. Number two, the discards. When you discard a, a, the snapper that, that are discarded in the temperature of that water, then they, you know, a large majority of them not going to live. Let's get it to where they're going to be in a time frame that we can get more out of the out of it. And that's what we're looking at. And Trevor, I know I messed it up somewhere, but no, you get so. I mean, if you think about what we're dealing with currently, we we never had to face this issue all the way up through the past two years, right? We were harvesting our quota and time and it was more of when are we going to close, not how long is the season going to be open. Um, so in the beginning, that time frame was 60 to 75 days. And, you know, we've, we've discussed it um, amongst ourselves and everything, but, you know, the, the practice of always shooting for a number as far as the quota is concerned um, can get you down the path quickly of, extending seasons and, and running into these issues that we're seeing now where the season is 103 days long and we've only harvested 75 percent um and what we'd really like to do here and what the proposal is to have some standardized season some fixed <laughs> season that we know allows our anglers a maximum opportunity um but also ensures the the fishery and and keeps our cpue up where we want it to be around 1.2 1.3 and and kind of really stabilizes us over time. And it's us taking what I'd call um, a proactive approach to the management of this fishery that hasn't been taken before. Uh, we keep kind of going down these routes. It happened in the 90s. It happens in the 2000s if you look through the history books. And we kind of get ourselves called in this need to, to extend the season out as long as we can to hit a number. And what we're kind of proposing now is, well, why don't we, you know, have a season that provides the opportunity for our anglers um, and at the same time try to make it beneficial for the stock as well and keep this going for the long haul. What do you do if you end up with an environmental factor, you know, a lot of wind for that first half of the season where people can't get out there or something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something we'd have to take into account. And I think it'd be more so on the back end of the season. So. You know, you would think on the front end of the season, there'd be a, a fair amount of opportunity there. Um, and the scenario I could see is potentially having some some um, pounds left and having it open during Labor Day like we've had in the past couple of years. And all of a sudden, we try to give our anglers that, you know, one more week of, of fishing and a tropical storm is nearby or anything else and it's blowing 40 and our guys are stuck at the house saying, well, you know, this is great. Thanks a lot for it. I mean, I think in those cases, we definitely try to give them another opportunity for it. Um, but I think the, the thing we'll have to talk about and, and the understanding that's going to have to come through is, you know, it might not be exactly to that number every year. We won't be shooting to harvest 99% of the ACL. We'll be shooting to provide our fishermen as many days as possible within that, that season that we've constructed and not keep it 
you know, moving along. So trying to provide that consistency that we've always had while ensuring the stock sell. Okay. Trying to shoot for not necessarily saying, as he just said, a number. The number's one thing, okay? That's something we have to live within. But the number that we're looking at is what gives the most most uh, effort that we can put as far as how can our anglers across the state of Mississippi or anyone coming from out of state that's coming here to, to catch our snapper, how can we give them the best ability to know when to come and, how, and, and be able to take the pressure off and keep the fish the way they are and have the least mortality in the discard? That's mm-hmm. what we're looking at. That's more important than anything. Uh, we can, uh, we, if, if we see down the way that the numbers are changing, we can always go ask, you know, for additional allocation. If we see things are working and everybody else is seeing things do it. But right now, that 110,000 pounds is, a, is probably a, a good number. And uh, because, number one, uh, the cost of everything to go out and the way the price is, and, and it's not just us. Alabama's of a third of what, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood of what they caught last year. Florida's extending their season all the way to the end of November because they hadn't caught it. You know, are we really doing anything by just extending the season? Or are we doing something by managing a resource? And that's what we want to be. We want to be a part of the answer and not a part of the problem. And that's what we're looking for. That's right. I like it. All right. Uh, one other thing we have is uh, the December 20th meeting. It's a week of Christmas. And uh, if a commission would like to, I'd like to uh, ask the possibility of changing it to December the 13th, <coughs> Tuesday the week before. And uh, and that way we can give pe- people ample time to understand. Is that something y'all would entertain? I'm looking at my, I'm good with that on my calendar. Damn. Sandy, we just need to make a motion to that or what? Yes, that's all. Just make a motion. And uh, if you want to stick with the 9 o'clock, just state that for the record as well. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to move December's meeting to 9 a.m. on December 13th as opposed to December 20th. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And no public comments. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Thank y'all.